Pet Life Radio. This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Is your pet stressed out? Does your pet need annual vaccines? Which pet is best for a child? Would you know if your dog was in pain? Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor, where you'll learn everything about keeping your pet healthy and happy. From pet care, pet meds and grooming, to pet food, pet insurance and dental care, this is the place to find out everything there is to know about pet wellness. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets because it's your pet. Health matters. Please welcome your pet doctor host, veterinarian media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Did you realize that by merely vaccinating your dog or cat, you could save the lives of over 55,000 impoverished people, the majority of them being children on an annual basis? That's one person every 10 minutes. These deaths come from a wholly preventable disease, canine rabies. Rabies is a viral disease that's been virtually eradicated from our domesticated pets in the United States because of a robust vaccination program, but it still ravages people, pets, and wildlife globally. My guest is Dr. Robert Duquette, an Associate Director of Veterinary Professional Services for Merck Animal Health. We're going to discuss how a rabies vaccine for your pet can be the life-saving shot that's felt around the world. We'll be right back after this short break. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. When we put him on the Dynavite, he took right to it. All of these symptoms disappeared. Dynavite is nutrition. If you want the dog to be healthy, you got to feed it something healthy. Something that he actually likes to eat. You need to put him on Dynavite. Dynavite for life. If you love your dog, you don't just want him healthy, you want him to be happy. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E.com. Oh. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Dr. Tiket, thank you very much for being on air with me right now in this World Rabies Awareness Day is coming up. People hear about rabies periodically on the news where a child was exposed to a rabid animal or somebody was doing something good for themselves, exercising and running through their foresty area and all of a sudden they were attacked by a rabid animal. But give us a little background. What is rabies? What kind of a virus is it? And what types of animals are susceptible to it? Great question, Dr. Cruz. So as you mentioned, rabies is a virus. So it's not like a bacterial infection. It is a a virus. And ultimately, it is a fatal virus. And this is why it is so dangerous. Not only can it be fatal to humans, it can be fatal to any mammal. And any mammal is susceptible to to get rabies. And most people that we encounter in in companion animal practice, you know, are, are owners of dogs and cats. And dogs and cats can easily be exposed if they're going outside at all, because rabies is still affects any wild mammal. And I think everybody, or maybe not everybody, but a lot of people see some of the more common carriers of rabies if they go out walking their pet at night, like a skunk or a raccoon, um, possibly even a wild coyote or fox. But one of the other more equally at risk, or possibly even more at risk, is, is exposure to a bat. And cats, especially, who are very, very good hunters, can catch bats. And bats can even roost inside houses. So if you have an unknown little bat living or bat family living inside your home up in the the roof or the attic, I actually have had encountered a cat that got infected by catching a bat inside the owner's house. And it was fatal for that cat. And it also, the cat, who wasn't vaccinated, infected, or at least exposed the owners because it had bitten them as well. Mm. I think that's one of the hardest things for people sometimes, Dr. Duquette, is to realize that even that indoor cat needs to be vaccinated because we had the same situation here where I am in Southern California, whereas down in Laguna Beach, a cat was minding his own business, was living indoors. Thankfully, this kitty had been vaccinated. And all of a sudden, the cat goes, wow, there's a bird that made it into my house. 
and it's not even flying all that well. I bet I can catch it. And that bird happened to be a bat, and it happened to be a rabbit bat. So we know that it's out there, and I was at some continuing education where they were showing the sizes of bat bites. And they have itty bitty little mouths and their little teeth are so small. It's like, wow, I think I have paper cuts that are bigger than bat bites. So it is scary what is still out there. Absolutely. And probably just to even add in a little more to that is wild animals that have rabies. Rabies, as I think we all know, affects the central nervous system and it affects the behavior and the way the animal is, is acting. And if It is a bat, which would normally want to avoid a cat quite easily, or a wild animal that would normally avoid humans and and pets readily. That change in behavior that can be even induced by rabies increases the likelihood that 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 pet is, or even human, could get exposed. I think most people will think of, you know, Cujo, the Stephen King dog that was just salivating and has hydrophobia, and it's just looking like it's the most absolutely mean animal. But you're right, that change of behavior, a bat that typically is not going to be out during the day. So if you happen to be walking around and see this bat fluttering around daytime, it's like walk the other way, call animal control very quickly. What would be some of the other signs that they may see that an animal has possibly contracted rabies? Well, wild animals, really the the key I would think that the most distinguishing sign is any behavior that would not be normal. And wild animals are, by definition, wild. And the great majority of them are always going to try and avoid humans. If anybody tries to pick up, well, this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't pick up a a wild animal or, or feed a wild animal. If an animal allows you, a wild animal allows you to pick it up by... More than likely, it's going to try and bite you to begin with. So any abnormal behavior. But um, the other thing is, like you, you mentioned as well, most wild animals are out at night. So if you ever saw a skunk, a raccoon, even a coyote or fox, or if you're in Puerto Rico, a, a mongoose going around during the day, let alone a bat, that to me would be another behavioral sign. In your pets, initial signs of rabies can be kind of just a, a vague malaise or not feeling well. And then it gradually progresses on to where it gets to the the central nervous signs. And not all of them are Cujo-esque, I would say, either. Sometimes you can get what we would call dumb rabies, where they are kind of have facial paralysis and don't have that hyperexcitability. But any change of behavior, even in your own pet or a wild animal, could be a sign of rabies. The other problem I, I would even add in is... That if your animal, if your pet gets bit, especially by something like a bat where you may not even see them, it can take between three, even up to 12 weeks before they start developing signs. So a, an unexplained injury that could potentially be a bite is something that you need to at least keep in mind. And I would definitely bring your, your pet into to seek veterinary attention for any unexplained wound or bite that, that you would see on them. So I think that's a great thing, Dr. Duquette, you just mentioned seeking medical attention. So if you have your cat who got out, came back and just had, you know, bite wounds all over it, scratches, is it from a cat that it got into a cat fight with? Was it, did it get into a fight with a raccoon? So many things are possible. When should you seek that medical attention? As soon as possible. And if your pet is vaccinated against rabies, it would be almost unheard of for them to actually catch rabies. But you need to get that dog or cat or any of your pets that have these unexplained wounds into the vet so they can clean them, treat them appropriately. And depending on the area you're in and what the the veterinarian believes, um, they probably would even give a booster vaccination if you didn't know what the animal was that bit them, or if you'd even seen but weren't able to obviously catch the animal. Ideally, if a wild animal does bite your pet, the first thing you want to do is is not get bit yourself. But the chances are you being able to, to catch that animal, well, I take that back, I wouldn't want you to try and catch that wild animal. I would call animal control to have them deal with it, but get that veterinary care as soon as possible. Very good information. 
I know that we've had cats and dogs who we know were attacked by a bat or attacked by coyote come into us. And if they were not vaccinated for rabies, they were put under quarantine. So the owners had to pay for that quarantine. Oftentimes it was going to be at my practice. Or sometimes it was going to be at animal control. But it could be up to 30 days that that pet was going to be quarantined. And that's just devastating. If we had a pet that was attacked and was vaccinated, then they could be quarantined at home and boosted, as you mentioned, for rabies just to be super neurotically cautious. Yes. And I I believe it, it might depend on different state regulations. But generally, if they are vaccinated and they had exposure, they are able to be quarantined at home. I believe it's it's for 10 days. I've also heard that if it's an un, you know, explained exposure, I think it might even, could it sometimes be even up to 45 days where it has to be, the animal has to be housed, like you said, either at a veterinarian or an animal control facility. And that's a huge out-of-pocket expense for the owner and the, the disruption to the owner and the pet's life for it being away from its owner and home for that long. Now, Dr. Duquette, you had mentioned that rabies is always fatal. Now, we've heard of some cases in the news where somebody was bitten by a rabid animal and they survived. Was that just the exception to the rule or was there some way of of treating this? With that, when a human gets rabies, and again, I I think I need to to state that I am a a veterinarian human um, doctor. So anytime I would always recommend somebody to go to their general practitioner or their family doctor to discuss any concerns as soon as possible if exposure happened. But if a human gets rabies, there are prophylactic treatments that they can give to prevent that rabies virus from penetrating them into the central nervous system and getting up to the brain where they do start showing clinical signs. Once an animal starts or a mammal starts showing some of the neurological signs of rabies, it is ultimately fatal. I think there might be around 10 to maybe 20 cases where humans did survive rabies after they started developing neurologic signs. But I think that's very much the exception rather than the norm. So any potential bite, you want to wash that wound as soon as possible and get to your your doctor to discuss what happened, as well as to tell them what animal bit you. So at least with humans, I think generally we should be able to to know relatively what type of animal bit us if if we did get bitten. Not always the case, but it's a lot easier with humans than it is with a dog or cat that's been out playing around at night. Definitely. Dr. Duquette, this is going to be a very naive question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So if rabies is a fatal disease in animals, why don't all the rabid animals just die off and there goes a disease? How is it able to stick around because we're vaccinating our pets? That's good. And if a raccoon gets rabies, it seems like that would die. So why don't all these rabid animals again just die? Well, for one, they don't die immediately. Normally, it's it's about a seven to 10 days after they start developing the neurologic signs. And even before when they're having that initial period of malaise, we don't know exactly when the virus actually goes from the central nervous system down into the saliva, because that's how it's primarily transmitted. The animal bites another mammal, and then the bite wound, the saliva gets in the bite wound from the animal's mouth, and it then slowly progresses up through the central nervous system until the dog or cat, like you said, starts developing signs of rabies. Being that they survive, you know, seven to 10 days, when they're having these neurologic signs to begin with, that kind of... It gives them a chance to spread the disease to other ones. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. when they're, they're confused, they're more likely to bite as well. So it's kind of like the animal lives long enough for the behavioral signs to occur to get that animal to bite somebody else to keep it spreading. So they're the walking dead that are just spreading the disease wherever they go. That's a great example. <laughs> <laughs> I know one of the hardest things, I'm being a veterinarian, being vaccinated for rabies. One of the hardest things I have to do when I travel, and I love traveling, is controlling myself. Because after about three to four days away from my cats, I need to touch something with fur. So 
several years ago, I had the great opportunity to be in China and there was all these dogs and cats and I just wanted to go up to them and love them and pet them. And I know that it's a real problem in that part of the world. So the recommendations that I've always heard is if you're going to be traveling, definitely get yourself vaccinated. It's not a hundred percent. Had a very close girlfriend who was traveling in Bhutan and that's going in India, that area. And her first day there, they went to a monkey sanctuary and she was minding her own business and this monkey came along and bit her. And she immediately had to go to the hospital and start on her rabies prophylaxis. So it's like, well, welcome to your vacation. Well, absolutely. And without a doubt, anytime you're going on traveling or going on vacation or even traveling for work into an area like Asia and Africa, I would say, are the the two main areas where we see the most human cases of rabies. But talk to your your general practitioner and get the recommendations because there may even be other vaccines that, you know, we have for humans to protect against other diseases. But I would even say, I think you're exactly right. It, It really depends on where you're going and what you're planning on doing. If you're going to an area where rabies is endemic and you're going to be out in the bush or, you know, not easily accessible to medical care, I would definitely consider getting that that vaccination series done before you leave. And it's not just one shot. It's a series of shots. So you need that adequate planning before you go as well. And Dr. Duquette, this is exactly what I'm always talking about. One world, one health, one medicine, a veterinarian talking about how people can protect themselves. So thank you. With that, we're going to take a short break. We're going to be right back talking about September 28th, World Rabies Day, and the impact that companies such as Merck are making in our worldwide attempts to keep rabies under control. We'll be right back. Please have a seat in the waiting room. The doctor will be with you shortly, right after these messages. designerpetsweaters.com hand knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat beautiful couture patterns for your pets including custom knitted formal wear casual wear, yachting and even sports themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats and a lot of sparkle each sweater includes leg loops front paw sleeves and leash opening visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four legged fashions today your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready large or small we fit them all designerpetsweaters.com let's talk pets let's talk pets on pet life radio pet life radio pet life radio dot com <laughs> Welcome back to the Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. The doctor is in, and we'll see you now. Dr. Duquette, World Rabies Day. The numbers of people that are still dying yearly from rabies is astronomical. 55,000 people yearly. Where are most of these deaths concentrated? Well, most of these deaths are either in Africa or in Asia. In Asia, a lot of them, like you said, are in China, but also in the the Indian subcontinent portion of Asia. And another equally, any death from rabies in humans is preventable. But another really sad fact to even add into that is over 40% of these deaths are children that are under 11. And this is because the vast majority of human deaths in both of these two areas are getting bitten by either a family or community-owned dog. And children are more likely, you know, to play with dogs um, just by our, our nature as, as humans. Children are quite a lot, are very inquisitive. And um, children being smaller are easier for, for rabid dogs or any rabid animal even to bite than they would be an adult. In so in these areas, um, so I understand India, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, as you're mentioning, China, Myanmar. These areas have a super high concentration of rabies. Is this mostly rabbit dogs or their wildlife that's also the issue too? 
Well, wildlife can be affected and a critically endangered um, form of wildlife. The African wild dog was actually almost wiped out by rabies. But the vast, vast majority of human exposure to rabies, either in when in any of those areas, is through domestic dogs that one are either owned or in some of these areas, dogs, you know, kind of have a little more freedom to roam around. So they're kind of community owned dogs. So Dr. Duquette, what I understand is Merck, the company that you work for, is collaborating with Afia Serengeti, meaning Health for Serengeti, Swahili, and also Mission Rabies, and that you have this huge goal of in 2030 to have a rabies-free world. And I just find that is such a fabulous goal. How is it going? We're making a huge improvement already, but both of those are, are two of our main charitable donations as far as what we're trying to help eliminate human rabies deaths by, by 2030. And the AFIA program, as you mentioned, that, that's in, in Africa. Um, that's been going on now over 20 years. We do donate vaccines to be used, which are, are then we're vaccinating the locally owned dogs in these communities. But it's not just vaccination. It's it's also education where we're going in and, and educating people in these communities on how the importance of, of getting these dogs vaccinated and how to protect themselves from getting infected. One of the, the great things we've, we've done with the AFIA program is we've created these comic books, which are for children. And then as we already were discussing that the vast majority of humans that are getting infected and, and dying from rabies are children. And it's a comic book that helps children explain to children how to prevent being bitten by any dog, let alone a rabid dog. And that's been a, a huge lifesaver in the, the program. We've also, like I said, exceeded that 3 million donation mark for rabies vaccines. And, and what Merck does for these, every Nobivac vaccine that's purchased by a veterinary clinic, Merck donates the rabies vaccine to be used. And this is an ongoing program that, that is not just on September 28th. It's year round where multiple vaccination um, drives are, are held. And I'd already mentioned education. It's not just us going in and doing it. We're also educating and training local support staff to be able to do this um, year round. And in those areas where this program has been implemented, we've already seen over a 70% drop in human rabies deaths. So it already is making a huge difference. And hopefully, as long as we keep it up and get these dogs vaccinated, we'll have a human death of rabies be eliminated by, like we said, 2030. Well, I love the idea of having a graphic novel because kids love comic books and you don't have to have words. You know, no matter where you go, you could have this storyboard in front of a child or even an adult going, oh, now I understand, you know, the concerns of you can't play with a dog, you can't tease it, and you can't, you know, throw sticks and stones at it, whatever, because of the ramifications. So that is an awesome idea. So I think that educational aspect is so important because we know there's so many diseases that I think if Merck and through this global coalition can get them educated towards vaccines for their dogs, then maybe in the same time, they'll be going to be much more amenable to having their children vaccinated, themselves vaccinated for other diseases that are out there. I understand there's one area in India since 2016 has been zero human rabies. That is just a huge improvement knowing that this is an area that previously was just ravaged by it. Yeah, no, it is amazing that the impact this has had. And I, I think you've hit one thing on the right smack tab on that, the head of that nail in that this is a one health approach. And Merck being, yes, we, I work for Merck Animal Health, but Merck Animal Health is, is part of the larger Merck family of pharmaceutical companies. And, and the vast majority of Merck is human based. And we do, fund fellowships to go into these areas with our human compatriots who also help work on eliminating and participating in these vaccination programs. In India, 
there's a, a little bit of overlap between the rabies free Africa and mission rabies, but largely um, mission rabies is also participates in Africa, but is more or equally focused in, in India, which the APIA program is, is not. That is specific to Africa. When you look at the CDC map of where rabies is throughout the world, it is very sobering to see that the numbers. And I found from looking at the Merck site that so many times people think that you're going to have to vaccinate 100% of all these village dogs. Ah, That's going to be so hard in order to make an impact. But that's not correct. What's the tipping point for vaccinating dogs where you really can keep those rabies outbreaks to a to zero? Well, that's a, an excellent question. And again, has implications in human health that we're, we're seeing in the United States right now. Basically, if we achieve herd immunity, which is generally accepted at about 70% mark, where 70% of the dogs, if we get them vaccinated, that is enough to provide herd immunity where you will not see an outbreak of a disease. And it's vaccine- well, vaccines really have been with the exception of clean water. I would say that the biggest savior of both human and animal lives worldwide um, to help us survive and prevent the spread of, of infectious diseases. And if you get to that 70% mark, that really does make it, it's the ultimate goal with preventing such an outbreak from occurring. Just on a more home basis for me, I'm part of the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association and part of the territory that this association encompasses is some very impoverished portions of greater Los Angeles. So there is a group, uh, Wags for Watts, downtown dog rescue that has gone into these areas and veterinarians now are volunteering their time once a month, along with veterinary technicians, to give totally free care. So we'll go in, vaccinate, deworm, flea control, microchip all these animals, and they've been able to see parvo, which parvo's disease that I'm so fortunate or I practice in Southern California, I haven't seen a case of parvo in probably 10, 15 years. And there it was still rampant. But after they've been in this area for several months, they could see that the parvo percentage just went down dramatically. So vaccines, you're exactly right. Clean water vaccines can make such a difference to the health and well-being of animals and people. What can people do? If they're listening to this right now going, okay, Merck is donating. That's nice. What can I do to help prevent rabies worldwide? Well, I'd like to think of, again, both worldwide as well as local, because we always need to, to act locally and think globally, but you can act both. <laughs> act globally, act locally. Locally, you want to make sure you get your pets vaccinated for rabies, because it, it is crucial. Any animal, like we already discussed, even an indoor-only animal does have a chance of getting exposed to rabies, and being it is a fatal disease in animals, if they were exposed by getting them vaccinated is going to basically eliminate the chance of them, them getting infected. As far as worldwide prevention, Merck does sponsor people to participate in these vaccine drives. And uh, we always are in search of volunteers. So not everybody has the time or the energy to, to make a travel. Um, of either to Asia or Africa, but if anybody was interested in that, they can go to the Rabies Free Africa or Mission Rabies, either websites or Facebook sites and, and get information on how they could participate in such a vaccine drive. A lot of your veterinary clinics, if you go to your, your vet and one, if they're using Nobivac vaccines, by getting your pet vaccinated with any Nobivac vaccine, you're indirectly contributing to this worldwide goal of eliminating human deaths um, by rabies by 2030. But a lot of other um, drives can be held at your, your local vaccination clinic and or veterinary hospital where there are ways to donate or raise money to help eliminate this, this potentially fatal human as well as mammalian disease, I, sh I guess I should call it. Well, Dr. Duquette, it's been 
great information, uh, really a call to action. So vaccinate locally, think globally. I love to travel, so who knows? Maybe I will be going to one of those sites, and it won't be a vacation. I know it will be something working, but what a great opportunity to help others. So my guest has been Dr. Robert Duquette, an Associate Director of Veterinary Professional Services for Merck Animal Health. Thank you so much for being a guest. I think you've just given us some really good information. Thank you again for, for inviting me to participate. The work you're doing is amazing and so important for both humans and animals. Well, thank you very much. This is Dr. Bernadine Cruz. You've been listening to The Pet Doctor on Pet Life Radio. Thank you so much for listening. Please tune in again next week. We'll give you more information on how to make you the best possible pet owner. Pets can be a wonderful addition to your life because they're a member of the family. Keeping them healthy and happy is important. Pet Life Radio presents The Pet Doctor with veterinary media consultant and veterinarian, Dr. Bernadine Cruz. Whether you have a dog, cat, reptile, or rabbit, you'll find answers for your pets straight from the vets. The Pet Doctor, on demand every week, only on PetLifeRadio.com.